president of the company. You need to walk in and you say, hey, I'm Troy. I'm a new employee. I hope to never cause you a problem, but I want to leave you this. Here's my cell phone. If you ever need anything, please call me. And this week, that may mean you need your car washed because that's probably all I'm good for this week is taking your car to get it washed. But there will come a day to where I will be more experienced. And I want to start now with you understanding there's not one thing that you need that I'm not accessible and available to do. This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 147. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode number 147 of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I'm the founder of L3 Leadership. We're a leadership development company devoted to helping you become the best leader that you can be. In this episode, you're going to get to hear my interview with Mark Cole, who's the CEO of the John Maxwell Company. And I just want to say that this was a bucket list interview for me. As many of you know, John Maxwell's had an enormous impact on my life ever since I was 17 years old. And what's interesting that I didn't know before interviewing Mark was Mark was actually impacted by John when he was 17 years old. And and uh, that's what really started his leadership journey as well. So it was awesome to have that in common with him. Um, but I had the privilege of meeting Mark many years ago at a leadership event, and I've been following his journey ever since then. And he's just a phenomenal leader. He's been with John Maxwell for 18 years, and he's currently the CEO of all six of John's companies. And what's amazing about Mark is that he actually started for John in their call center and he was just making calls to get butts and seats to John's events. Um, and so, and now he's the CEO of six companies. And so in this interview, we actually talk about Mark's leadership journey and how he went from making calls to actually being CEO of all six of these companies. We talk about what it took for him to get there. And we spend a lot of time about talking about what it takes to be a great number two. I absolutely loved my time with Mark. I know this interview is going to add a ton of value to your life. But before we jump in, I just have a few announcements. If you're new to the podcast, we're committed to bringing you three or four episodes every single month to add value to you as a leader. One episode will always be from our leadership events that we host. One will be an interview that I do with a high-level leader. And then once a month, you'll get a personal leadership lesson by me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe and leave a rating and review on iTunes or whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. It helps us get a lot more exposure with listeners. So thank you in advance for that. And I want to thank our sponsors, Henny Jewelers. They are a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor were John Henny and my wife Laura and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers and they are just an incredible company. Not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people, which is what I really love about them. Uh, John gave Laura and I a book to help us prepare for our marriage. Uh, he actually gives books to every engaged couple to help them invest in their marriage. And he's personally been investing in me as a leader now for years as a husband and a dad and I'm just so grateful for him. So if you're in need of a great jeweler, go to hennyjewelers.com. I want to thank our other sponsor, Alex Tuland and Real Estate Resources. Alex is a full-time realtor with Keller Williams Realty, whose team is committed to providing clients with highly effective premier real estate experiences throughout the greater Pittsburgh region. He's a member and supporter of L3 Leadership, and he would love the opportunity to connect with you. You can find out more about Alex and his work at pittsburghpropertyshowcase.com. With that being said, let's jump right into the interview with Mark Cole, the CEO of the John Maxwell Company, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Oh, hey, Mark, thank you so much for, for being willing to do this podcast. And why don't we just start off? I think it's interesting. You've, I just saw you post the other day. You've now been with John uh, for 18 years, and you're his right-hand man and the CEO of his companies. And can you just walk us through that journey? You know, What do you wish people knew about what it took to get there uh, and where you're at at this stage? Yeah, I would I would love to, Doug. And and by the way, for those of you that already know Doug, you're blessed. I'm just fortunate today to get to hear some of John uh, of Doug's backstory with John Maxwell. And so, just right before we we pushed play on the podcast, Doug was telling me that at 17 years of age, he was turned on by a CD when he was in high school. Major life circumstances led him to say, "Okay, I've got to have something different." And uh, it's almost like that CD, Doug gave you permission to lead that standing tall CD. I have a, ex, ex, all, a the, I don't have the life circumstances, but my interaction with John was first at 17 as well. And I read a book. Somebody gave me the book, Developing the Leader Within You. And what I had been feeling since I was five years old, that I was destined to lead and influence people at 17 through the book, Developing the Leader Within You, John gave me permission to lead. Hmm. And uh, my life from that point, from that point, much like yours, has been significantly impacted by John Maxwell. So the real story with John and, and where I am today, leading six companies, being John's right-hand guy, really started May 1st, 2000. John was starting an event called Catalyst, which is a Christian church leadership 
conference that John Maxwell and a guy named Andy Stanley, pastor here in Atlanta, Georgia, they started together to impact the next generation back in 2000. I had been doing youth work for a denomination for a, a consortium of churches here in Georgia, over 120 churches, and I was uh, the youth president for the state of Georgia. So I had some work in developing next generation leaders. So they invited me to come on to be a part of their team. And I started, if you can believe this, Doug, I started at entry level, the ground floor, as a telesales agent, putting rear ends in seats of events that John was doing, and specifically John and Andy Stanley. Wow. So it kind of started from there, and I, I could bore you with the details, but what I love about that part of the story is I came in with no title, no position, no authority as a leader, and I have truly time-tested John's content in his own organization hmm. to show that you with influence, without position, without title, but with sheer influence, work ethic, hard work, you can create and craft a space, even in a leadership, what I believe is the premier leadership brand in the world. Uh, it works. The content works. What you and I experienced at 17, it really does work. And I'm a testament of that. That's incredible. And so I'm curious, so you're the CEO today. I mean, when you came in and you were part of the call center getting butts in seats, did you, did you have dreams and aspirations of, of one day being John's right-hand man? Uh, tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so I, I was fortunate. I, I come from leadership stock. Now, that's Southern for all of you Northeasterners. That's <laughs> Southern for my genetics. I, my parents, they're leaders. My grandparents were leaders. I, I, at five years old, knew I wanted to tell people what to do. That's what I thought leadership was at five <laughs> years old. And uh, so I, I was a leader. I wanted to be a leader. So in life, I've always wanted to, quote, sit at the table where decisions were made. I don't, I don't aspire for positions or titles. I never have, but I want to be where the decisions are being made. And so I, I have to confess, I mean, from very early on, the answer is yes, I wanted to be a leader, but it was, but the favorite part of my story is I, I, I was all, I'm always a reader. I love to read, but it was, it was at 31 when John and his team challenged me to get a, a personal growth plan. My personal growth plan led to what now has become my life plan, which is a very diligent process I go through every year. Maybe someday I'll get back on your podcast, Doug, and we'll talk about personal growth plans. But that personal growth plan led me to, at 33, discovering my life mission, my life purpose. And maybe we'll get into that a little bit later today. But the clarity of my life purpose then empowered me through prayer. And I, I'm, a, I'm an old schooler. I have prayer and fasting. I really went before the Lord and said, Lord, where do you want me to go in the next 12 years by the time I'm 45? And Lord, if you won't tell me where you're wanting to go, I'm going to put on my paper where I want to go and you bless it. But it, you, you get first option to speak very clear, me, clear to me on what you want. And there were probably some of those 42 things that I put in my 12-year life plan to get to when I was 45. There were probably some things that was inspired by him. There were probably a lot of things that was inspired by me. I say all that to say at 33, as a telesales person, I was started leading some teams by that point. I put on that I would like to be a part owner of a company like at that point, you'll remember this, Doug, the company was named Enjoy. Yeah. I'd like to be a part owner of a company like Enjoy, and I would like to be the CEO. And by the way, here were some of the things that were my own personal. I'd like to make 10 times what I make right now. I want my salary to be 10 times what it is now. And I, I put down 42 things like that. So hmm. at 33, I put in, uh, I put very tangibly in my life plan that I wanted to be the leader wasn't a position thing, but it was definitely I wanted to feel the responsibility of leadership. And so at 39, when John invited me to be his youngest CEO of, of his, at that point, two companies, we now have six, um, it was absolutely something that I had put on paper several years before because I wanted to be at the table where decisions were made. So... I love that. I'm curious. So I'm sure, I don't know how many other people in the organization have come and gone, but they may have wanted the same thing. But, 
you know, you're still there and you actually got it. What do you think separated you from maybe everyone else that, that may have wanted to be sitting in the seat that you sit in or sitting at the leadership table? Is, is there anything specifically you did to keep making those mm-hmm. jumps? I, yes. One is, is I, I surveyed my peers and I always intentionally worked harder. It wasn't to get noticed. It was to gain influence. So I think there's a heart issue that I'm going to try to deal with in the answer to this question. There's a motive issue, if you will, but there's still an issue that the person that works the hardest, the person that has the best attitude will jump, will, will, will leap over, will leapfrog was the word I was looking for, will leapfrog even more competent, more educated people most of the time. John says it like this, when you're interviewing two candidates that all things being equal, the person with the best attitude wins every time. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you that I worked hard to maintain a great attitude, even in difficult times. I can tell you that I was very diligent to find out what the expectations, the bare minimum expectations were. And I set bigger expectations of myself. I worked harder. I worked longer. I was more available. I was more accessible. Um, John tells a story. I did the same thing, but John tells a story of his nephew when he had a, had a new job at a very large real estate company. He came to John and said, John, I finally got my break. This is my break. What do I do to get noticed? And John said, there's three things I want to tell you. The first thing is, is he said, I want to ask you what time, the start time. The guy said 8.30, Troy is his name. Troy said 8.30. John said, not for you. Your start time 7.30. He said, what's closing time? Troy said, it's five o'clock. John said, not for you at six o'clock. He said, how long is lunch? He said, an hour. He said, not for you. You need to have your lunch done in 30 minutes. So work hard. That's basically that. The second thing John told Troy to do, he said, Troy, in the first week, you need to ask for an appointment with the president, with the president of the company. You need to walk in and you say, hey, I'm Troy. I'm a new employee. I hope to never cause you a problem, but I want to leave you this. Here's my cell phone. If you ever need anything, please call me. And this week, that may mean you need your car washed because that's probably all I'm good for this week is taking your car to get it washed. But there will come a day to where I will be more experienced. And I want to start now with you understanding there's not one thing that you need that I'm not accessible and available to do. So it's wow. availability. And then the final thing is consistency. I mean, I did today I worked just as hard as I did as a telesales guy. I, I I wasn't I wasn't working hard to get noticed. I was working hard because I wanted that to be my brand. And I think that's a very important thing is to be consistent. Don't just work hard to get noticed. Don't just work hard to get a promotion. Don't work to just work hard to get a CEO so then you can go every day out on the golf course. I, I, I established that early on that I wanted that to be my brand, that I would work harder than most to be successful in everything that I do. I love that. Um, what would you say, what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned along the way to where you are now? So I, I, yeah, I I love this question. And, And if you don't mind, Doug, what I would do is I travel around with the five most impacting things that I've learned from John. And so I have it on my iPad. I, I use pages on my iPad, whether I'm speaking, communicating, or whatever. And so when I saw that question this morning, I just pulled up my iPad, and I, I'm going to read you the five things. And I share this a lot of places a lot of times. But it's really important because this has shaped my life personally. It shaped my life with my incredible family, my wonderful wife, my two daughters, my two grandsons. My life is better because of this because I work hard, as I've already said. But these five things have helped me significantly. So here they are. And I'll slow down so that your listeners can write these down. But the five most impacting things I've learned from John is one, to ask questions. Doug, I'm a type A personality. I love to tell people what to do, not because I want to manage them, but because I I, I want to see more and I want to see before other people. But John's taught me, slow down, ask questions, because a self reflected revelation is much better than an other's directed revelation. Mm. So when I can ask questions, Doug, as you're doing so well today, I can help myself hear what's really inside someone else's mind, but I can also help them discover the answer that's already in them. 
So ask questions. Number two is grow personally. Have a personal growth plan. Don't just sell the stuff, do the stuff. And so growing personally has been big. Third one is keep options. You know, I have a lot more resources personally than I had 10, 12, 15, 17 years ago when I started with John. But really, it doesn't define me. I'm not more wealthy. I'm not more privileged. I just have more options now. I can get places a little faster because I can I can buy a plane seat rather than a, I have to drive 10 hours. It, money is simply just to give options, not to create wealth. It's to be able to give more. It's to be able to save more for my family. It's to be able to take them on a little nicer vacation now because I'm gone several nights a month. We can do things more. It's keep options. The fourth thing is make memories. So one of my favorite things, if you follow me on social media, I try at least once a month to intentionally create a memorable moment that my family will reflect on when we review the year at the end of the year. I want a memorable moment a month. So I am very intentional on making memories. We're going to make a memory this weekend. My family and I, I can't, I can't wait. I hadn't told them what it is yet, but we're, we're going to make a memory. And then finally is uh, think realistically. So ask questions, grow personally, keep options, make memories, think realistically. Believe, believe um, optimistically, but think realistically. I love that. So good. So you obviously have a, a great job. I'm just curious, what are some of the favorite things that, that you get to do daily? What do you love about your job and what's most fulfilling about it? So seeing people reach their full potential, Doug, I believe, you know, I, you, you have, you have hundreds, thousands of listeners, no doubt. You have people that will, will listen to this, this podcast, not because of me, they don't know me. They don't know this Southern redheaded guy, but you've built a brand. You've built a connection with the community. And so I come in today, and what I know is I probably won't impact a dozen people. I certainly won't in, impact perhaps a hundred, maybe a thousand people with my words today. But my hope is one person that listens to this podcast will find one nugget that will make their life better. And truly, every day of my life, I can slow down at the end of the day as I do every day as a daily discipline. And I reflect on who was my one person of impact today. And I and, and so this opportunity, walking alongside John, well, running alongside John, there is no walking beside John, running <laughs> alongside John. Every day, I have the ability to tangibly see my life mission of adding value, motivating, inspiring people to reach their full potential. Every day, I have the opportunity, opportunity to tangibly see that at work. And it's, it's extremely rewarding. That's amazing. Uh, I guess on the other end, I didn't have this question in there, but I love when John jokes that, that his last book is going to be leadership sucks. <laughs> and, uh, um, yes. uh, so I'm curious. So for as fulfilling as your job is and for all the amazing things you get to do, I'm sure it's not all glitter and glamorous. Uh, can you just talk about, you talked about thinking realistically. Can you talk about the realities that also come with your job and all the responsibilities and maybe the, the letdowns kind of not the highlights that everyone sees, but what are the behind the scenes that, that are challenging? So it's so funny that you asked that question. I love that it's not on here and that you, that you throw it in. I love that by the way. So have at it. But the reason I love this question is it's just breaking this great smile across my face. It's literally Doug five minutes before I've uh, I was on the phone with you. I was on the phone with John Maxwell, which is kind of a daily thing. There's nothing new there, but we're dealing with a significant issue, um, a really significant issue. Um, it feels like it's not of our own making. It probably is. We just haven't dissected it that far yet, but it's, it's something that it feels like is happening to us and not something that's happening because of us. And so it's kind of one of those moments. Where it's a leadership sucks moment is what it is. So I was on the phone with him, and, and, and of course, he is just a blast to work with in the good days and the bad days. And I was on the phone with him. I said, hey, I, I really don't. I have 10 minutes before I'm on the phone with a podcast. And, and so we, we don't have long, but here's the update of what I've been working on yesterday. And, and uh, here, here's the reality. It, it does not look good. And we, and we kind of started laughing. I said, hey, John, you know, there's about 51 weeks of the year that people really would love to know what it's like to be you. 
let's just call this the one week they don't. <laughs> and so we kind of laughed and, and, and we just had a, we had a great moment there and he did, he laughed, I laughed and, and, and you know, I'll do the, uh, we'll, we'll have a good time on this podcast and then I'm going to get off the phone and I'm going to go see some more leadership sucks stuff that I've got to do. And so, it, you know, it is, it, it's, it's, it's truly, it's truly the reality that grass is not greener on the other side. I love what I do. I pinch myself every day. I cannot believe what I get to do. And there's a lot of responsibility that, that, that if I were not content that this is where God has me, there are days that I would question the validity of the price tag on this opportunity. Today, maybe yesterday, might be one of those days. But as leaders, we don't look at the moments. We look at the minutes. We don't look at the minutes. We look at the days. And then, and maybe in the last couple of days, I don't look at the days. I look at the year and realize how significantly blessed I am at what we get to do. I believe, I taught this last Tuesday on a, on a call with hundreds of our coaches I do every week uh, in one of our companies. I taught them, you know, you know what you get um, you know what you get when you squeeze an orange, Doug. Your listeners know that. You, you, you get orange juice. You, you get what's inside. You know what you get when you squeeze a lemon. You, you get what's inside. Well, you know what you get when you squeeze a person. You get what's inside. That's good. I don't believe great moments make leaders. I believe difficult moments make leaders. I don't believe great moments reveal leadership. I believe the difficult moments reveal leadership. That's so good. Along those lines, you, you, you said you talked about paying the price. It's actually interesting. I'm doing a lesson on paying the price, but what prefaced it was uh, my favorite story probably that's impacted me was when uh, John shared that he, he was at a conference many years ago and a young leader came up to him and said, John, I want to do what you do. And he said, well, uh -huh. Dan, do you want to do what I do? But the question isn't that. The question is, do you want to do what I did so you can do what I do? And you talked about the price tag of that. And, and basically, John's advice to the kid was find out what the price is and then determine whether or not you'll pay it. Can you talk about the That's price right. that it takes for you and, and John to sit where you are at today and the way that God's using you? What's the price that comes along with that? The real, the real person paying the price is family. I mean, I think about in this conversation, I mean, when you ask me what's the price I pay, I really want to tell you the price that Stephanie my wife is paying. I really want to tell you the price that my, my family's paying. Um, and, and, and it's not that we're not in this together. It's not that my, that, I mean, I have extreme support. I want to talk about the price that, that Kim, my executive assistant pays. I, I want to talk about the price that this incredible team that I'll go out and have a meeting with in a little while. I want to talk about the price they're paying because y y as a leader, you know, I, I, I get the cool opportunities. Doug, I get to meet you today. I mean, how many people would die to be able to talk with you and your audience about L3 leadership, about what you're doing, Doug, in Pittsburgh to change that community? Do you know how fortunate I am to even be able to try to answer these questions for you? I'm a blessed man. So I don't really see the price tag a lot of times. Now, there are days, and I'm going to answer the question from those days that I realize the arduous, difficult, mundane effort required to do what we do. But most days, man, I do not see it as a price tag. I see it as a reward system. Hmm. But there is the price. Everything worthwhile is uphill. You've heard John say that. You're a student of John. Everything worthwhile is uphill all the way. I work just as hard, if not harder today. I mentioned this a little earlier as CEO, as I did when I was making 70, 80 calls a day. I have more reasons to lose this hair and have the receding hairline that I have. <laughs> I have more reasons for the gray to start popping out around my temples that's going on. I have more reasons, absolutely. But the all the way is the thing that I probably would focus on to answer this question. Many people, they buy in for a difficult season. They don't buy in for a difficult journey. Hmm. They want to get to the crest and coast. And, and, and real leaders, significant leaders, leaders that are going to do powerful things with their life, 
they don't look at difficulty as stopping at some mile marker at some location. They realize they signed on for difficult. My wife, about about six years ago, maybe seven, it, it was right around the transition of leadership and I was beginning to take on the task. In fact, it was a year in. So let's let's call it uh, five and a half, six years ago. Man, I, I came home one day and it, it, just the tasks were ex- extremely hard. And I began to ask myself, man, am I really, is this really right? And my wife coined a phrase. In fact, she went up, she's not very good on computers, but she went to her computer and she typed out this bold, biggest font that would fit on one side of the paper that she went and printed. I was having a tough day. I was on a phone call. I, I paused the phone call and I told Stephanie, I said, gosh, I don't know if I'm made for this. And she came back with this statement that still sits in my office to this day. And it says, you were made for hard. Hmm. Wow. Now that's not going to impact you. Perhaps Doug's probably going to impact anybody listening to the podcast, but that day and many, 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 many days since that sign has reminded me that I was made for the price tag. I was made for how difficult this is. And so there are days, there, there are, there, there's a price tag. It, we, we pay a little bit of a price. John, John today is paying a price for, for significant leadership. And, um, but boy, I wouldn't have it any other way because most days it's not a price tag. It's a reward system. I love that. Well, thank you guys for paying the price you do. Uh, It's impacted me and I know millions of other leaders. So thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you. I want to transition into, I just put it under the caption, being a great number two. You know, we live in a world where everyone wants to be the number one guy. Um, But can you talk a a little bit about the joy that comes from being a number two, knowing where your sweet spot is and just fulfilling your calling, loyalty, um, and what it takes to be a great number two? Yeah, I had the gift. Doug, and again, maybe this is another day to talk about failures and and some of the most defining moments in a person's life. But I had a defining moment for me when I realized um, the shortcomings in my person, in my character, in my humanity without God. And I went through a significant career change, a significant transition. I mentioned all that I was doing, and then I came to John and was selling events. That was a real redefining moment for my life. And in that defining moment, I found myself at my, the early part of my career, my 20s, I found myself accelerating way. I, I found myself accelerating at a pace that my internal man could not sustain. And that's very important to even where I am in my growth word for this year, my word for the year. But so that's a whole nother story that I could take, man, a long time to talk about. But in that redefining moment of my life, I made a commitment to the Lord and I said, Lord, I had been a number one. I had had the spotlight on me, way too much spotlight for my ability to sustain uh, that kind of influence. And so in that redefining moment of my life, I told the Lord in a very humble, very broken place in my life. God, if you will allow me to be a friend to someone of, 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 of high regard or high respect, if you'll allow me to be a friend to them like I didn't have, I will sense your glory and your, your presence in my life. So give me a chance to be a confidant. Give me a chance to be a shoulder. Give me a chance to be a support system, an Aaron, a her for a Moses in life. You know, many of us look at ourselves as, all of us type A leaders look at ourselves as Moses, and we're looking for Aaron and hers. Who am I going to lean on? Who am I going to lean on? And I was a, I was a Moses, if you will. I, I had the vision. I had the thought. And I, I just didn't build an infrastructure of Moses and Aaron, or Aaron and her around me. And that's a biblical context for those of you that don't know. But I, uh, I made a commitment to the Lord. And I said, if you'll let me be an Aaron or a her, I will wear that with passion, appreciation, and understanding that your hand is still at work in my life. Now, most people don't have that because their internal man's much bigger than their outside man. And so they don't go through what I went through. But that was a gift to me, Doug, because I love being a support system for John Maxwell. 
Now, there are days I am the number one man, and I've got to look for number two, and I've got some Aaron and hers. I've got some number two people around me. So I, I'm now at a stage in life where I, I feel that. But my greatest joy and where I sense God's greatest pleasure, and I sense God's answer to my prayer at a very desperate time in my life is when John leans over at me and leans to me privately and allows me to serve him as a confidant, as a friend. My greatest accolades, my Grammy moments, are when John stands on stage and doesn't say, Mark Cole's my CEO of all six of my companies. This is the best right-hand guy I've ever had. My greatest moments is where it, when John says, this is Mark Cole. He's the greatest guy and support I've ever had. That, that's my Grammy moment more than John saying, this is the CEO of my company that does all that. That's my Grammy moment. And so I, I, I sense God's pleasure by having number one, uh, 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 when I have number one seat ideas, but I get to serve in a number two seat. I sense God's pleasure. Now, most people probably don't have that experience, but for me, it, it, it's a great reminder. It's a great understanding of God's smile on my life when I get to be a number two guy. I absolutely love that. And it, I guess if that deals with the heart of being a number two, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the actual function of a number two. And sure. John's latest book, No Limits, uh, I love it. There's a whole uh, section devoted to what makes you an invaluable number two. And uh, can you just walk us, and for those who are number twos or really anyone who reports to anyone, what's the greatest way you can add value to the people that you're serving? And how do you actually do that for John uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, and you'll see in the book, and so I'll be a little redundant, but man, we worked hard on this question to answer it in the book. And so, um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to try to give you too much new right here, but the real deal, I'll give you a little bit of story behind each of the points. But John's agenda is my agenda. And here's what that means. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a type A personality. I'm a, I'm a one, number one guy. I mean, I want to be a leader. I want to feel the responsibility. The greatest thing I understood, the greatest revelation I had when, I, when it began clear that I was going to be a number two guy, as great as it is to be a number two for a guy like John Maxwell, it's still number two. To a competitor like me, it's still number two. It's not the quarterback, you know, it's the, it's the center, it's the, wide, it's the wide receiver, it's the running back. And um, I realized that John and I could not have an agenda. John's agenda had to become my agenda. So I'll never forget six and a half years ago when I thought, okay, how am I going to run the company? I'm now the CEO. What am I going to do? What's my vision? What's I going to do? And I sit back and I went, okay, Mark, it can't be your agenda and John's agenda. So I sacrificed, did away with, put my agenda aside, and I allowed John's agenda to become my agenda. What's happened in the last two years, though, Doug, it, it, it's really interesting. In the last two years, by making John's agenda my agenda, it's now becoming our agenda. Hmm. I've been given a chance to speak back into the vision and the agenda of the organization. And it's really cool how I give up my agenda. I make John's, my, I make John's agenda my agenda. And then now I'm being given opportunity to have a voice in the agenda again. Second point is, is I'm available. As a second man, I believe that I have to be available. Now, I run companies. I'll be, I'll be speaking um, to 35, 40 of our staff a little bit later today. I will, um, I'll be making a million and a half to $1.8 million decision later this afternoon. I set up every new meeting with new people that doesn't know me. And I say, hey, guys, let me tell you this. I'm the CEO. I'm the decision maker. I've been empowered to make the decision here. But if my phone rings or if I get a text from John Maxwell, he's the real number one. And I'll need you to forgive me, but I'll put the meeting on pause and go make sure that I'm available to number one. Now, there was when I first started doing that, Doug, people went, huh? This is like, this is weird. We're having a meeting and all of a sudden Mark needs to go. But I determined that if I was going to be a great number two, that I had to put aside traditional ways of running as a number one, i.e. CEO in charge, everybody show up when I do, and realize that there is a submission that my team needs to understand 
that I, as a number two, am always available to John. There's some days John abuses that. I've told him that. I'd tell him that if he was on the phone right now. There's some days <laughs> he'll call me and he'll call me and I don't see the call. And then I see the call and I text him and say, hey, I'm running a meeting right now. Can I call you back? And he'll text me back and say, no, I need to talk to you. And so I'll say, hey, guys, give me just one minute. Restroom break, bio break. Go do your thing. I'll be right. And I'll go out and I'll say, hey, John, I was in this meeting. He said, yeah, man, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But look, Mark, I, didn't want, I, didn't, I wasn't at a place where I could write this down. And you really need to follow up with this person. And I went, John, I just stopped a client meeting and they're getting ready to sign a million dollar contract. <laughs> and you wanted me to come out and take this down? He went, yeah, man, I'm sorry, man. I know. I'm sorry. He said, but man, I just needed to get this off my plate. I went, aye, aye, mas- aye, aye sir. We got it. I got it. Take care. He said, okay, go back to your meeting. Have a good meeting. Now, here's, here's my point. I want everybody to understand. I don't take my role as CEO seriously. I don't want other people in my company to take my role as CEO seriously. I'm the number two guy. And when the number one guy needs something, I want him to know I'm available. Third thing, and I can keep going through a list. You tell me how long you want me to go on this list. I always figure out how to fit things in. Now, that's a difficult one because you, you have 24 hours, Doug. I have 24 hours. So it's really not a stuffing more into a 24-hour period. We all have that. It's prioritizing. And I learn when something is passionate for John, I learn how to fit it in and make sure that I prioritize what he's wanting available. I, 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 I prioritize what he's wanting. I'm a, I remain close to John. That goes back to availability. I call it a proximity, though. I'm, I'm approximate to John. I'm, I'm close to John. If I, I'm on the road with John 80% of the time. If John's on the road eight out of 10 times, I'm, you'll see me right with him running companies. I'm blessed with some incredible incredible staff around me now. But even before that, I was running companies at night, midnight, running companies. And during the day, walking around John, carrying his bag. Didn't care if people thought I was an EA, his assistant, um, a, a bodyguard. I've been called all that stuff. But I was running his companies by staying approximate to him. I allow John to be John. I ask questions. I don't lead by assumptions. I make sure um, I make sure that uh, my reports know that we're on the same page. So I'll start out and say, John, this is what I think, but I really need to hear what you think before I go create action items on this. And then I love him. I, I on, honestly, the closer I've gotten to John, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked for somebody like this, Doug, but I've worked for people that the closer you got to them, the more you wanted to go do something else. <laughs> the closer I get. The closer I get to John, the more I want to do more about what our brand, what our vision represents. I, I'm more passionate about him 17, 18 years in than I was on day one. That's great. Uh, I, w- I want to transition a little bit into just you just telling uh, everyone that's listening to this a little bit about what all of your companies do. I mean, People may know John is a speaker and author, but you guys are certainly doing so much more than that uh, around the world. Can you talk a little bit about the John Maxwell team, Equip, and everything else that you guys are doing to impact leaders around the world? I can. So we, we, have, uh, we have separated ourselves into six companies, and I'll tell you real quickly about each one of them. Um, and, and some of them are divisions of one corporate structure. We actually have multiple corporate structures, multiple LLC, S-Corps. Um, and so uh, mostly it's centered around John Maxwell's intellectual property. John has written over 100 books, and uh, he, he's written on a diversity of subject matter. But his, his kind of – his sweet spot is leadership. It's personal growth of leadership. And uh, so we've taken that hundreds – of, of, of books that he's written, and we've turned that intellectual property into instructional design and delivered it to different market segments that that instructional design most applies to. So uh, the first one is the John Maxwell Company. That is uh, taking John's intellectual property and designing it for corporate solutions. So we have corporate coaching. We have corporate training. We, work, we have worked with clients and work now with clients like uh, Delta Airlines, Microsoft, Aflac, State Farm, uh, some very, very big ones. Our sweet spot is the $25 to $50 million shop 
that wants to train their senior level, their mid-level managers, and then do training and value add to their um, employee pool, if you will. So that's the John Maxwell company. We have John Maxwell Consumer, and that is taking John's personal growth ideas, intentional living, personal growth, put your dream to the test. And we've instructionally designed that for men and women that want to be better, that want to do better, that want to be better men and women, better husbands, wives, better business leaders. So that that's a, kind of our tip of the spear, John Maxwell Consumer. And uh, John has sold over 29 our 28 million copies of his books. And so we want to take those book buyers, the people that have been impacted by books like you and I were at 17, Doug, and we want to create a buyer's journey for them so that they, that's from a business standpoint, but really the vision is, is to give them a journey of development rather than a moment of development. So that's John Maxwell Consumer. We have Maxwell Motivation. That's John speaking and writing a company. We have a team of researchers, writers, um, analysts that go out and, and, and help us develop the latest, greatest leadership thought content. They help us with social media. Uh, John, John speaks all over the world in every stream of influence. He'll go from a mega church of 25,000 to speak for Delta Airlines, to speak for a direct marketing company, Amway of sorts. He'll go to the United Nations, speak for governments. So, so that's all Maxwell motivation. Fourthly, uh, we have the John Maxwell team. That's our, that, that's the one company that's not based here in Atlanta, Georgia. They're based in uh, Florida, West Palm Beach. And uh, we now have certified over 14,000 entrepreneurs that have went through our online course where they've come to Atlanta, Orlando for a three-day certification event, and they now have hung a shingle outside their door, and they are entrepreneurs that are selling themselves as speakers, uh, trainers, uh, coaches, and we've designed uh, five to seven of our intellectual properties We've designed it so that it can be delivered in smaller groups, in, in masterminds, in small group settings, as well as keynote speakers. And so we have, again, 14,000 of those certified coaches that are selling our content in 146 nations around the world. That's the John Maxwell team. We then have Equip. Equip is John's heart. It's who John is. He has taken his intellectual property. He has giving it biblical illustration and biblical application. And we've taken that training into areas that need it the most around the world, but have the least amount of access of biblical-based training. Its goal is to fulfill the Great Commission. It's to train leaders who will then go help people understand the Great Commission, the call for evangelism. We now have foot soldiers in every nation of the world. Last June, or June 2015, rather, um, we finished training equipping people through at least a three-year process, many countries, nine years, in the last country of the 196 nations recognized by the United Nations. So we have foot soldiers in every country of the world that are training biblical-based leadership through EQUIP. And then finally, the newest organization is the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation. Because of John's global work and because he's been recognized by Inc. Magazine, American Management Association, by the Leadership Guru Organization, he's been recognized for the last seven years in the, in, as the foremost leader, thought leader and expert in leadership around the world. That has opened up a lot of opportunities. And so we now have, Doug, if you can imagine this, we now have over 20 countries that the president or the heads of state, the prime minister, have invited us in to open the door to work with all of their top level screen leaders, business, education, family, uh, health, uh, youth, church, seven, eight streams of influence coming together and opened up the door for us to do transformational work in their countries. And so we've launched two countries. We're working with Guatemala and Paraguay. I just got back three weeks ago from meeting with the president of Costa Rica, and we're getting ready to launch in Costa Rica as a third country. We'll mobilize 200, 300 of our coaches from around the world. We'll go in and train 15 to 20,000 in one week facilitators that will then, as already identified in their businesses, in their churches, in the government, they've already identified five to 10 people they're going to take through a 12-week 
values-based leadership course in roundtables. And so we'll go in, we'll launch a country, and we'll start out with 20,000 facilitators that are going to continue doing 12-week roundtable lessons for several years to where we will have 10% of a country's population that have been through our values-based training to begin transformational work and mobilizing them for greater good in that country to do leadership activity that addresses the greatest lids of that country faces, things like poverty, things like illiteracy. We are training these people on the values, on the why we do what we do, and then we mobilize them to the what. So that's the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation. We're just having a blast, man. Yeah, you guys that, are that, busy that, at all. That was a, yeah, that was a quick little snapshot, but I hope I didn't overplay it. But man, I certainly could have talked a lot more about what we get to do on a daily basis. But hey, that's what we get to do. What I really get to do is talk to you and your, your group of listeners on the podcast. That's what I really get to do. Yeah. Well, hey, we got to wrap up in a few minutes. I feel like I could talk to you for for the next 10 hours about things. I am curious, this will be my last question before probably the, the closing questions where we get real serious, but uh, can you just talk about the role of the faith plays and evangelism plays and what you guys do? Uh, I love John's story when he converted to the business world and you know every illustration he ever had got lost, but he still has a heart for evangelism leading to people to Christ. Can you just talk about the God side of what you guys do that people may not hear about all the time? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, John says there's two areas in his life. He said he's redefined every area of his life. He's repurposed every area of his life except two areas, leadership and evangelism. John's an evangelist at heart. When he was a pastor, he had a personal goal to see 200 people personally led to Christ a year by his own efforts, by doing his own Bible studies, his own evangelism methods. So he wasn't just preaching from stage. He was actually out going out and doing it. John is an evangelist at heart. It, it gives him greater joy than anything in the world. And so when John left the pastor, a lot of people thought he had lost his faith and lost his evangelism heart. And really, we can now see this 15 years later. We couldn't see it then. But really, what God was leading John to do was to go into an area that did not care what his faith was, but wanted to know how to apply his stuff to make their businesses better, to make their governments better. We now realize that God has just taken us on a 15-year, almost a two-decade two journey to gain the kind of influence in areas that know nothing about God so that we could bring them to the correct picture of God. I could take all day, Doug, and talk about this, but suffice it to say that most people don't even know there's a church in their area. Church is not on their radar. They don't even really know if they want faith because there's such a, a, a wrong perception of you and me and our faith, Doug. The world has the wrong perception. And so God's given John this message on the four pictures of God, three wrong pictures and one right picture. And so we believe every shred of influence we've been given is for such a time as this so that we can see massive evangelism and a massive understanding of the right picture of God for a latter-day revival. Last year, we saw 50,000 people in a business setting come to Christ. 50,000. Wow. That's amazing. By 2020, we want to be able to say through Equip, that 1 million people by 2020 has come to Christ because of our efforts. We just got done. This is a great time for this question, Doug, because I just got done last week in Minneapolis of a four weekend swing, taking Easter out, a four weekend swing to where John and myself have spoken to over 32,000 business leaders in a network marketing company. Four cities, Spokane, Las Vegas, Spokane, Washington, Las Vegas, Calgary, Minneapolis. We've spoken to over 32,000 um, business leaders who we speak on Friday, we speak on Saturday, and then on Sunday, they allow us to have a volunteer faith service to where 90% of the people of the 32,000 come back for an early morning faith service. We have a little music, then John speaks, or in Minneapolis, I do. We speak, and uh, we have seen just over the last four weekends of this 32,000, 90% come back for the faith service, we have seen over 7,700 people come forward and give their heart to Christ. 
We're seeing it everywhere. We'll go to Guatemala in the next few weeks. And these people that have never heard the gospel, the correct picture of God, the ability to accept Christ, they've never heard it. And if, if statistics continue, we'll speak between the fifteen to 20,000 people that have been through our roundtables through the John Max Leadership Foundation. We'll give them a lesson. We'll tell them we're getting ready to have a volunteer time to share the four pictures of God. We'll give them five minutes to leave if they want to leave, if they don't want to be offended. 90 plus percent stay. And we've been seeing over 55 percent of the people come forward. We give them a Bible. We connect them to a, a resource of next steps. And so everything that we're doing, the, we realize that we have been given stewardship of a massive amount of influence that we're now in a place to where we're seeing God's kingdom be glorified and lifted higher in John's ministry and John's life than we've ever seen it before. That's absolutely amazing. Um, la- la- I'll just leave this open-ended as we uh, close, but any closing advice to leaders, just anything, I'll just leave it open-ended. And then can you close with telling us how we can, if someone's listening to this and saying, wow, I want to be a part of what they're doing. I want to partner with John. What are the best ways we can serve you guys and pray for you? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. And again, I can't stop but yeah, you know, I give you a lot of stuff. We see a lot of stuff. We're thankful, but it's all God's. It's all been given to us. We're just we're just some human beings that's trying to follow faithfully what the Lord's calling us to do. No different, Doug, than what you're doing through this podcast. And for the men and women that are partnering with you through L3 leadership, that are partnering with you for your vision for Pittsburgh and that area that are partnering with you in in what you're trying to do to make God famous. I can't tell you guys. The first thing I do is not tell you to join us. Get involved in what Doug is doing right there. You need to be a part. Doug needs you. God's given him the vision. You are his provision. So so get a part. We're, we're trying to set people like you up, Doug. That's what we're trying to do. I can tell you about meeting with the president here, the president there. I can tell you about meeting with the secretary of, of education for the United States in two weeks. It's all exciting. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's just being a good steward. And for every leader, now I believe a lot of your people are faith. I don't get to talk to people of strong faith every day of my life. But if you're strong in your faith and you understand that everything that we've been given and everything we're being called to is for his glory and his honor, be a good steward. Whether I'm in a secular space or a faith space, be a good steward is what I would tell leaders. If you've been given influence, it's not for your benefit, for the benefit of others. We talk about servant leadership. We talk about adding value to others. Those are not buzzwords. Those are pillars, tenets of Christ-like leadership. Be a servant. Find somebody today, gang, that's listening to this podcast. Find somebody today that you can add value to that you could never in your wildest dreams get something back from them. Add value. Serve. Be a leader of consistent integrity above all else. So this open-ended, again, I, you didn't tell me to do this, Doug. You wouldn't have even probably given me an open-ended question if you'd have known I was going to bring it back to get involved in L3 leadership because Doug didn't tell me all that. But I know that's what needs to happen here. If you've been given the gift of this podcast, and I hope I've impacted those of you listening, I really, really, really do. Not because I need an attaboy or a, or a kudo. I've got way more of those than I ever have deserved but because I'm called to inspire you to do something, not just be something. And the first thing you need to do is you need to get involved with L3 leadership. You need to ask Doug, Doug, you've been giving to me month in and month out. You've been bringing people to the table. What can I do to serve you and Laura in what God's called you to do? Now, if you need to get in touch with us and there's some way we can serve you and there's something you'd like to be a part of that we're part of, go to johnmaxwell.com. You can, you can go to johnmaxwell.com and pretty much everything that we, we do is there. I equip is our 100% faith stuff. So if you want to weed through all the corporate stuff because you want to let somebody else do that and you want to get involved in our faith initiatives, I equip.org, I E Q U I P.org. But again, let that be a second step or let that be a first step if we can serve you. 
not to get involved in our stuff. Where I want you to get involved, gang, is with Doug. I want you to get involved in what he's doing. I want you to ask him how you can serve him. This guy is working hard. He could be doing 100 things today, and he's trying to ask this Southern talking guy some questions that will hopefully make sense. So I appreciate it, Doug. Thanks for letting me be a part, man. I am blown away that you would consider me an option to be a part of what you're doing. I'm, 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 I'm incredibly grateful and thankful. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to my interview with Mark Cole. I hope that you enjoyed it. You can find ways to connect with Mark and everything that he's doing at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 147. A few announcements before we wrap up. I want to let you know that we recently introduced L3 Leadership Membership. That's right. You can now become a member of L3 Leadership. For just $25 a month, you'll get into all of our breakfast events for free. You'll get a free L3 Leadership t-shirt. You'll have access to joining one of our mastermind groups and access to our member-only site filled with extra content, resources, Sources and courses to help your leadership go to the next level. For more information on membership, go to l3leadership.org forward slash membership. I want to thank our other sponsor, Bab Inc. They are an insurance broker, third-party administrator, consulting firm in Pennsylvania and all across the country. They're a company led by my friend Russell Livingston, who is very passionate about developing next generation leaders, which is why they allow us to host our breakfast there every single month. They're a really unique company, and if your company has any insurance needs, I encourage you to check them out at babbins.com. That's B-A-B-B-I-N-S.com. Lastly, if you want to stay in touch with us and everything that we're doing at L3 Leadership, you can sign up for our email list at l3leadership.org. You'll also get a free copy of my ebook, Making the Most of Mentoring, which is my step-by-step process for uh, getting meetings with leaders. And I really hope that it'll add value to your life. Again, if you enjoyed the podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe, leave a rating and review. It really helps us grow our audience organically. So I appreciate that. Thanks again for being a listener. And as always, I like to end with a quote. And of course, I'm going to quote John Maxwell in this one. Uh, He said this, and I love this. He said, you will never outperform your self-image. Think about that for a little bit. You'll never outperform your self-image. Thanks for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. Laura and I appreciate you so much, and we'll talk to you next episode. (music)